Paul, we're here at uh, the World Intellectual Property Organization's meeting, uh, I guess it's July 19th. That's correct. And uh, we're here at a uh, meeting of the Copyright Committee here. I was wondering if you could uh, give the listeners uh, your name and explain who you work for. And then uh, uh, you were telling me that Canada has recently passed a legislation that deals with this issue of cross-border exchanges of works for people with disabilities. I was wondering if you could summarize sure. what the Canadian law does. Sure. So my name is Paul Whitney. I'm a career-long uh, public librarian, recently retired. I'm on the IFLA, International Federation of Library Associations, governing board, acting as a consultant, doing some work on print disabled issues. And I'm here as an IFLA delegate to the uh, SCCR 24 meetings. Uh, the Canadian government recently passed new copyright legislation which contains a number of fairly innovative elements. Uh, there was, however, some uh, clauses relating to alternate formats for the use by print disabled, which although taking a very tentative first step in the direction of cross-border movements uh, of alternate formats, did introduce a range of constraints on that activity which we found very disturbing. And certainly the Canadian Library Association intervened with uh, federal bureaucrats and politicians, indicating that they felt it was inappropriate for the government to take this kind of step in terms of placing constraints on cross-border movement of alternate formats at the very time when the WIPO SCCR group was addressing this very issue and in all likelihood we hope will come forward with recommendations which go far beyond what was contained now, what is contained now in Canadian law. So the kind of constraints that the government introduced included issues such as for an agency in one country to provide an alternate format to an agency in another country, both being authorized to serve the visually impaired or print disabled, that rights holders approval would be required for that movement and there were constraints on the movement of content based on the author's nationality. So, for example, if there was going to be movement of an alternate format between Canada and the United States, the only works which could be uh, transferred between agencies would be works authored by nationals of either Canada or the United States. Uh, so a range of issues on constraints which would Im impose very, very severe logistical difficulties on the agencies trying to carry out this, this activity, and the very fact of requiring rights holders uh, approval would in fact slow down the process to the extent it becomes almost meaningless. Now I believe that the government would characterize this as a tentative and necessary first step towards what will be an acceptable outcome. Uh, we regret that they chose not to show more leadership on this issue internationally by actually bringing forward um, a legislation which more closely mirrors what is discussed in some of the treaty text, draft treaty text that is being reviewed by delegates here. So, um, you know, at the best case, a very minor gain, um, and I think, unfortunately, something where we feel there was a, a lack of leadership displayed. Paul, you know, I'm this issue about asking the the permission of the right owner for using an exception to a copyright seems almost uh, an oxymoron. I mean, can you explain what the thinking there is? Well, I think the thinking is also to do with cross-border movement element. And we've run into this in, in before, uh, where there is great reluctance when the feeling is that a legal copy in one country is not necessarily a legal copy in another country. And when you have issues like, particularly with what a lot of the alternate formats we're dealing with, where there are regional uh, distribution agreements, separate publishers in separate countries, uh, and very separate regimes about how alternate formats can be created under what circumstances. So I think the government was very nervous about the notion about a Canadian produced lawful alternate format work moving into a country where in fact that work would n could not have been lawfully created in the country receiving it. Well why doesn't the Canadian law just say uh, the, the copy has to be lawful in both countries as opposed to saying it has to have their permission of the copyright owner? That, that could be a potential solution but it, as I said this was a very tightly constrained uh, re reworking of our act. Um, it was disappointing because in essence we always felt that the Canadian legislation with respect to the creation of alternate formats for the visually impaired really set a kind of gold standard for for the uh, for the world and really pointed the way forward both in terms of how print disabled were defined and also in terms of how agencies could pr proceed to produce the alternate formats without rights holders permission so it's it, we, it is in fact unfortunate that they did not see at this time it, that uh, they could move to extend these kind of uh, rights to the international transfer of the content.
could you, uh, which are the publishers uh, that have seem to have the most influence on these debates in Canada? Um, I, I think the publisher, I mean, one of the most frustrating things about this file is that, you know, when you sit down with everybody, everybody agrees that this is the kind of thing that should happen, right? It's hugely frustrating in Canada right now because we have a situation where the primary charity, the Canadian National Institute for the Blind, CNIB, which produces alternate formats in English language for the market, um, they are saying they want to get out of the library business. Governments are n not in a position to step up and actually assume any kind of financial commitment at this point, is what they're telling us. Um, so we're, we're, we may be losing ground at the very point where we should be gaining ground. And this is not the publisher's fault, right? And by and large, I think publishers in working with on the visually impaired file in Canada have been cooperative. Uh, but I think this notion of territoriality is, is one of the real stumbling blocks for them. Um, and, and obviously they have great concerns, as is the case internationally, with uh, who are the agencies that are allowed to create alternate formats and um, you know what sort of record keeping and, and also the, the whole issue about who actually has the right to have access to those formats. But I would characterize the publishers on this file as being largely um, collaborative but with one or two, for want of a better phrase, blind spots. Would, would, if you're a blind person in Canada and uh, a, a, a treaty passed that would permit the United States, England and Australia to share copies of accessible works with blind people in Canada, what would that change for people who are blind who live in Canada? It would be a huge improvement. Uh, we have a situation now where there is huge inefficiencies built into the current regime because essentially agencies serving the, the visually impaired and print disabled have to recreate the work, if you will, country by country because the cross-border movement is, is constrained. Uh, this is a huge issue, for example, students who have very time-sensitive need to access content. When they're enrolled in a class, they should have that content the day the course starts. Uh, and if we find a situation where the alternate format for the textbook exists in the United States, but that we have to, as agencies serving that student in Canada, turn around and actually start the process of creating the alternate format, you're talking about weeks, and in worst case, it may in fact be more, more than months. Uh, to actually get that work in the hands of the students, and that's that's unacceptable. It's it's a it's a totally inappropriate it, it's sort of suppression of sort of human potential, uh, and it, it's just unacceptable in the 21st century that this kind of thing is going on. Uh, thank you, Paul. Is there anything you'd like to add? Uh, no. when I we're all sitting here and uh, just hoping and praying that the, the, the SCCR delegates are able to reach agreement on uh, recommending a treaty instrument for the visually impaired. The time is long overdue for this to take place and we are uh, desperately hoping that this in fact happens. And has Canada provided positive leadership at this meeting on that issue? I would say that, that Canada to date uh, during the deliberations has not been actively engaged in any of the discussions. So I would have to say, unfortunately, I think the answer to that question is no. Thank you, Paul. Okay.